Blair and I'm the Director of Education at the MSU Museum. And today we are really excited to have another session with Dr. Julian Chambliss, um, who will be doing a, a, a talk today about his new exhibit coming up at the MSU Museum. Uh, the exhibit is called Beyond, Black Pan Beyond the Black Panther, Visions of Afrofuturism in American Comics. And uh, we will be, uh, like I said, having uh, Dr. Chambliss speak with us. Uh, he is um, going to discuss Afrofuturist symbolism in the comics and discussing how the upcoming exhibition builds on definitions of Afrofuturism. Uh, and you'll learn more about that today. And so I'd just like to say a little bit about Julian before we start. Uh, Dr. Julian C. Chambliss is the Val Berryman Curator of History at the Muse mm -hmm. MSU Museum and Professor of English with a joint appointment in history at MSU. In addition, he is a core participant in the MSU College of Arts and Letters CEDAR, the Consortium for Critical Diversity in a Digital Age Research. His research interests focus on the race, identity, and power in real and imagined urban spaces. An interdisciplinary scholar, he has designed museum exhibitions, curated art shows, and created public digital history projects that trace community, identity, and power in the American South. Uh, today, Dr. Chambliss will take questions at the end of the presentation. So um, be sure to write your things down that you'd like to ask or uh, be ready to do that at the end. And also we have a short um, poll, just asking you a couple of questions at the very end about your experience here today. So before you sign off, we'd love it if you'd uh, give us some input on today's experience. Um, so thank you so much for being here again and Julian, it's all yours. Okay, hopefully my errand at will uh, work for me. I'm gonna share my screen here. Hopefully you guys can see that. So I'm happy to be back to talk a little bit more about Afrofuturism. Uh, as you know, um, these talks are in relation to our upcoming exhibit, uh, Beyond a Black Panther. Um, and uh, for this talk, I really wanna sort of explore this, this concept of uh, Afrofuturism as a project of recovery. Because of course, when we think about Afrofuturism, uh, it is not just simply a question of future oriented narratives, although futurism is very important to how we properly understand Afrofuturism. So, uh, right away, I'm calling our attention on this first slide because I have the cover of All Negro Comics number one from 1947, which I mentioned in my previous gallery talk as an example of a particular comic produced, drawn, and published by African Americans uh, in the anthology format, in that there is a character called Lion Man, which I'll mention briefly uh, later on. But this comic in itself is, is an object of recovery for, for many, many years. Uh, it was not really known in the public mind. And so when we think about Afrofuturism, this periodization question, what are we trying to recover? These are really important questions. So um, well, obviously when we say Afrofuturism, uh, the visual language of Afrofuturism really points itself towards that definitional uh, logic that we associate with when the term was coined in the 1990s, as I mentioned in a, in a previous talk. That definition by Mark Derry put a lot of emphasis on uh, cyber, cyborgs and, and prosthetically enhanced African Americans and, and this idea of Afrofuturism. So when you Google Afrofuturism, you see imagery like this, that this is produced, uh, designed by John Jennings, uh, who is a scholar and artist who's in our collection here, who we, we've had on campus here at the Department of English uh, and at the museum. And uh, John's work uh, and his collaborator, Stacey Robinson's work, uh, mixes a lot of the sort of like visual language that we are associated with Afrofuturism, right? You see the sort of like circuitry engaging with black bodies. You see these sort of African symbology. It's all right there in that imagery. And this is a common language of Afrofuturism in a popular, popular aesthetic. But, you know, Afrofuturism could also be thought of as different ways of seeing, like as we talk about when we talk about the definition of Afrofuturism, it's a recontextualization or decontextualization of a European-based model 
for understanding knowledge and how the world works. And so in that context, you know, how can we think about Afrofuturism? Well, I always think it's important to sort of put this in the context or in dialogue with, with broader questions of like how knowledge is created, how perception of society are, are built. Um, Alex Zalaman has a great book called Black Utopias. And he talks about this in the context of, you know, African-American vision of utopianism in the context of America. And he makes this great point that America uh, is really built on utopian visions. Literally the name of the country itself is at, at some level a kind of imagined space being called into, into beings, right? So the geographic definition of the United States is really about this sort of um, futuristic, transcendent civic religion. Uh, and for me personally, I think we can trace this through very strong sort of consideration of how public space has been developed over time and work I've done with colleagues. We've looked at the rhetoric of city plans and, and urban spaces, and they're very much constituted around visions of citizenship, visions of space, invoking and shaping and creating people. And so this idea of like imagined spaces being deeply intertwined with like actual spaces becomes a backdrop to some of this concern that we might have with the potentialities around visioning future spaces, but also these questions of recovery of past spaces, right? And I think this is an important, important part of um, what we can think about when we think about Afrofuturism. Uh, I, I bring this imagery uh, to bear because uh, a lot of the critical geographies we have in the United States in terms of like success or failure are also racialized geographies. And, and nothing um, makes that clearer to me than when we think about someplace like Kofini Green uh, and, and the rhetoric of the post-war sort of like critique of the inner city and the ghetto and, and the sort of ghettoization narrative that's attached to African-Americans and the problems that that represents in terms of like ways that we can possibly vision uh, positive ac activities in these spaces. Like it, at, at some level, black spaces can only be recovered, can only be redeemed when they are no longer at some level black spaces like Cabrini Green, public housing, these things have to be destroyed, this place moved and other people brought in for the value to, to be there. And, and today, this place that historically we, that was associated with like quote unquote failure is really high end condos and, and been redeveloped. And, then, and that's part of this whole narrative of gentrification and displacement that, that plagues American urban areas. So when we think about, when I'm thinking about this process of recovery, um, I've had an opportunity to, to develop a kind of uh, oral history project with Afrofuturists called Voices of the Black Imaginary. And in that, I've talked to uh, African-Americans who are thinking about Afrofuturism. And one of them, Ronaldo Anderson, of course, is a leading sort of theorist, is a professor of communication at Harris Stowe University. And, and he talks about Afrofuturism as the overlapping tropes of science fiction, history, trauma, reparations, and politics. That that is the framework that he sees Afrofuturism allowing you to work in, right? And so this is really, I think, a really important point to, to, to keep in mind that there are these overlapping tropes that he says of history, trauma, reparation, politics, and science fiction. That's a really different set, different set of um, factors driving Afrofuturism. And it's important to keep in mind the implications thereof, right? Because, uh, Afrofuturism, in his mind, is theorized and practiced depending on the local population and what it has to deal with, which is also a really important point to keep in mind. So like one of the things that I think is emerging as a, a narrative around Afrofuturism is that there are more than one kind of Afrofuturism, that there's an African Afrofuturism, there might be a Latin American Afrofuturism. All these people, of course, we have to think about them in the context of diaspora, but the situations on the ground, right? The tool that Afrofuturism is in relation to those questions of history, those questions of trauma, those questions of reparations become a really important way that Afrofuturism emerges as a toolkit for transformation for people in these different contexts. Uh, of course, Kojo Oshun is, is one of the earliest sort of theorists around Afrofuturism. And he points very, very clearly to this question of like the past as an important part of Afrofuturism as, as he characterizes it as a program 
of recovering histories of counterfeitures created in a century hostile to Afro diasporic projection and space in which critical tools, right, um, for intervention are being created, right? And this is this is from a great article actually from um, Centennial Review, right, which is a publication out of MSU at the Department of English. So the idea here that Afrofuturism is concerned with recovering the past and it's a tool for transformation should undergird any any time, any, any, any instance when we're thinking about Afrofuturism, I think. And that's important to keep in mind. Another question that I think is always important is, is to understand is this particular moment somehow different from other moments? Like, you know, the a sort of cultural renaissance, uh, artistic production, uh, and in particular, you could think about the Black Arts Movement of the 1970s or the Harlem Renaissance Movement of the 1920s. And are, are these consistently different? And I think that this is an important point to make because each one of those movements, I think, can be contextualized in Afrofuturism because they fit into that framework that Ronaldo Anderson offers up, right? Like when you think about the media being created, um, these questions of history, these questions of trauma, these questions of reparations and power are really important. Um, Aldu Faynama talks about this in the context of comics and in his book, Super Black, where he talks about the, the emergence of black superhero characters. As, and as I said before, when we think about comics in the American experience, for decades, the, the visual language of comics really fit very neatly into the repressive, regressive narratives associated with blackness in American culture and, and broader white culture. And it's only in very key moments where you have interventions often driven by black people that we see a break from that. The all Negro comics of 1947 is an important element of that. The black newspaper comic strips um, of the 1940s and 1950s that's also an important intervention. While the mainstream, the quote unquote, white produced media is still locked in that, tr in, in those tropes of minstrels and regressive racist imagery. And it's only when you start getting to the 1960s and especially the 1970s, that you see an explosion of black characters like the Black Panther, which you know we draw a name from and is often seen as an Afrofuturist character, that you see a, a break from this. and in, the rise of the black art movement, the black power movement, the relationship as Nama points out here between black representation and American race relation is apparent in the explosion of like black exploitation film, but also in the explosion at some level of comic book characters. So if we can read these characters, I think very much into that Afrofuturist framework where like questions of trauma, questions of, of power, questions of history, are, are made bare. And I, and I can point to obviously a perfect example of this, a character that's gotten a lot of attention in recent years, it's Luke Cage, who's a 1972 character, um, hero for hire. Luke Cage's story is not divorced from the history of the black experience. In fact, it's very much informed by both a contemporary moment of the 1970s in black power and its critique of structural racism, but also a longer history. And when we think about this, we have to think about this in, the, in, in terms of like the hierarchy of representation that's being pushed by Marvel Comics, because this is happening in the midst of a kind of effort on the part of mainstream society to normalize these narratives of um, the rights revolution of the previous decade and the previous decade and a half. So if you think about the 1970s as a period I think it's important for us to historicize it as a period where we're trying to normalize questions around race and gender that were the, the bedrock of social movements of the previous 20 years, right? So if you look at the comic books that are produced in the 1970s, they fit into that idea, but they're also commercial ideas are fetishizing in the same way black exploitation is fetishizing black people, they're fetishizing the potentialities around this normalization in a way that's very problematic. So you get horror comics, which is definitely a trend that's aimed at an urban market, but you also at the same time are getting more African-Americans in comics like Black Panther gets a series in the 1970s called Jungle Action. You get the master of Kung Fu, right? You get female characters 
who are sort of analogs of previous generation male character by Shannon Sheeda and so on and so forth. Um, in the pages of um, Luke Cage, as I say, these questions of trauma, these questions of recovery, these questions of history uh, and reparations, they're playing in the background in the story, but they're being done in a way that is at some, some level ham-fisted, but it's important for us to recognize this. In, the, in that very first story where Luke Cage introduced, the question of a abusive nature of the prison system on African-American bodies is a key, a pivotal point of the narrative, right? There's a reform war that comes in that, that actually um, gets Luke Cage from out of a situation where he's being abused and being forced to fight for the entertainment of the guards and for money. Um, this is not, this, this, this idea does not ignore what is something that is a, at the core of the critique of the prison system that's on the, on the minds of people because of the Attica riots that happen at the same time and you know, calls our attention to the longer legacy of uh, Black people being criminalized in the public square. And so while these comic pages don't seem to be directly connected, in the ethos of Afrofuturist framework, we can look back and recover this strand of this concern around trauma being visited on Black bodies. Uh, even um, we can connect this through uh, the fact that Cage himself is wrongfully accused. He's a bad man, as, as a lot of scholars have pointed out. Let's see if this fails. All right. Uh, oh, make it so I can share my screen again. You're okay. all set now. All right. Sorry. Uh, okay. Sorry, internet. Sorry, bad internet. Okay. Where was I? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So hopefully my internet won't fail me. Uh, so. For Ronaldo Anderson uh, in his work talking about the visual culture of Afrofuturism, he puts a lot of emphasis on the D. Harker, D. Harker. <laughs> We're moving That's hierarchy. Okay. It's early in the week. <laughs> oh wait, no, it's late it's in really the week. Late in the week. I don't right. know what's um, going on. <laughs> right. In 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 the context of sequential art. So what I want us to think about uh, when we're thinking about the, the pieces that are in the show, that was all just for me to lead up to talk about the show. <laughs> uh, can we recover, uh, what can we recover through the pages of Black, uh, that are provided in Beyond the Black Panther? So obviously, the, uh, as I've spoken about before, Lion Man is a prime example of a kind of internationalism and focus on innovation that was common to African-Americans. And this idea in itself is a recurring theme in African-American mind, right? I, I think we can trace a concern with diaspora, in particular to African-Americans. And I'm always careful here to understand that when we're talking about American comics, we are talking about African-American view on the diaspora, right? So some of the traumas, histories, and, and sense of reparation associated with the American experience is framing this visual language, this, this narrative that we're seeing in the pages of these comics, both in terms of the recovered past that is represented by the original Lion Man, and even in this sort of reimagining by contemporary artists, in this case, again, John Jennings, you know, a really leader in terms of the visual narrative of Afrofuturism, in his reimagining of all Negro comics, because this project, the covers that you will see in the show or him imagining what if all Negro comics, which only published one issue in 1947, what if it continued to be a publishing company just like Marvel Comics, or even a publishing company that did eventually stop publishing like Charleston uh, um, or Dell, right? That published for 20, 30 years. Uh, what, would, what would Lion Man have done? Well, he would evolve as all comic characters evolve. And so when you see the show, well, you'll see is a number of covers of him imagining Lion Man being redesigned and, and rebooted for different generations 
moving forward from his introduction in all Negro comics. And of course he's imagined a, a, a logo. So there's a lot of like visual culture and symbolism here in each one of these covers. And when you're visiting the show, you should think about each one of these as an attempt on his part to imagine this character who sort of fits within a kind of Pan-African thought process being reimagined for different generations. So how, how does each character, each cover represent a kind of growth of, of black thought that again, attacks and, and subverts the sort of like hierarchy around race and power, not just simply in the American context, but also in a kind of like international context. And that's one way we should understand the visual language, the visual, visual narrative being offered through, through that part of the exhibit. Another way that we can sort of think about this um, is to sort of think about this in terms of critical race theory and its intersection with Afrofuturism, right? So, you know, critical race theory thinks calls us to, to keep in mind this challenge of hegemony, a commitment to social justice, the importance of storytelling and, and, and counter storytelling and transdisciplinary uh, perspective, all very important in critical race theory. And those things also, I think, undergird and intersect with Afrofuturism, right? So when we're looking at the stories that are being told, uh, another example of, of how this is sort of being expressed is in the work of the, the Gibbs sisters, who the invention of DJ Whitaker, uh, these are two uh, uh, animators, comics creators, entertainment writer, producers, who are creating an alternative history that brings together elements of Afrofuturism that reflect the sort of um, black feminist framework, but they also re reflect this sort of you know, recovery of a lost history. And they're very deliberate here because in the story, you know, mentioned E.J. Whitaker, they place that story in the context of the Tuskegee University. And in researching this story, they actually uh, went to Tuskegee University, they, they toured the grounds, this is a picture of Tuskegee University from 1916 is still an ongoing concern, a uh, testament to the vision of Booker T. Washington. Uh, but they were very moved by what they saw and in speaking with them about their work, they were very, very much like, this is a story that people don't know, that, that Black people don't know of Booker T. Washington, of the university, of the kind of uh, transgressive revolutionary figures that, that walk that ground that are not just a female, but also female. And so in their creation of their um, comic, they have a sort of central, central character who is a young black woman who's an inventor, whose father is a professor at, at um, Tuskegee University. And this takes that real history that they, they feel is lost and intersects it with a, a broader history of Black female activism uh, in this period that's also lost and personifies it in a, a female character who's an inventor who is seeking to, to have a positive impact on the world and really sort of like captures like an important element of how Afrofuturism calls our attention to the contributions of women of color, to the, the safety and, and promoting uh, stability within the Black community and the, and the pressures that that puts on them as women, as they deal with both patriarchy, as, as figures trying to be in, in the leadership and, and, and concerned with family, concerned with community, and also dealing with racism that plagues, um, plagues society. And so the, the ideas that were present in the early part of the 20th century that sort of drove the sort of middle class uh, activism of education and uplift that can be very problematic that in fact, at some level, sometimes greatly hampered the voices of African-American women. It get reimagined and recontextualized, calling attention to the importance of women as actors in that space, which a lot of scholarship has, has made clear in recent years, that the sort of international uh, links between women of color in the United States and in, in the UK, their concerns about the politics of family, about the politics of, of power. These are important things that this comic calls our attention to and contextualize in the, in, the, in the context of a story that it also has many of the tropes we associate uh, with comics, like a, a, an inventive genius 
who goes on an adventure, but the nature of that adventure cannot be divorced from those hidden histories and those, those traumas associated with African-Americans. In a similar, similar vein, when we think about um, another comic in, in, the, in, in the show, Ajala is a intersection between uh, two creators, Robert Garrett and, and Stephen Harris, who imagine a kind of female character that again traces through a history in this place, in this case, a history in New York City that for African Americans and scholars of African American experience, it makes a, a lot of sense. Like this is a story of a young girl who works for a secret society dedicated to uplifting the community. They have codes, they have costumes, they have all these things. But when we think about this in the broader scope of the American experience, the African-American experience, this is not that far from the real history of the UNIA. And so I wanna hopefully show a little clip from this video, but it might crash. So hold on a second. college. After working for a pan-African newspaper, Garvey returned to Jamaica in 1914 and formed the United Negro Improvement Association, or UNIA. The UNIA was about black self-determination. It was about galvanizing the ideas of black repatriation to the motherland, the continent of Africa. And it was extremely important in terms of getting black people to understand self-pride, pride in one's race. Inspired by Booker T. Washington to raise funds and start his own school, Garvey came to the United States in 1916 and in 1918 began publishing the Negro World newspaper. Garvey was extremely outspoken. He was, some people would say, almost bombastic. He wanted to take over Africa and had elected himself as president of Africa without consulting the Africans, unfortunately. Determined to achieve economic independence for African Americans, Garvey launched the Negroes Factories Association in 1919 and a shipping company called the Black Star Line, which he planned to use to transport passengers back to Africa. Gar so Marcus Garvey, of course, is an inspirational figure for a lot of black nationalists uh, who built on previous black nationalist rhetoric from the 19th century and inspired Black nationalist rhetoric subsequent to him, like Malcolm X. But in Ajala, the ideas represented by that kind of Black independence, the creation of a, a system of support, economic and social uh, protection, uh, are, are centered on a community spirit center, or CSC. And the main character is a young girl, a 13 year old girl, who's a junior agent for that organization. And in fact, she comes from a family who are agents in that organization. And the, the comic series really focuses on her journey becoming a senior agent, right? Like she's growing, she's growing up in that organization. And the opening scenes of the comic are really her on patrol, protecting the community from, from crime, from disruption. And the story really centers on her trying to balance out her identity as a teenager, but also embracing the responsibility and the heritage associated with being a member of the CSC. And in many ways, this character encapsulates the struggle, the tension that many women feel in terms of their own sort of, you know, Black women feel in terms of pursuing uh, their own sort of like self-realization, but also doing that in negotiation and in, in narrative and in, in, in conversation with their responsibilities to family, their responsibilities to community. And I think it's a, a great example, again, of how the sort of Afrofuturist framework can see links across time, across space. And, and I urge us to think about the implications of each one of the, the comics that are in the, in, in the show, representing an ability on the part of the creators to piece together through their own sort of like cultural understanding the threads that unite a kind of consistent investigation, interrogation, and re reconstitute, 
recontextualization of the possibilities around blackness. And that's one of the things I think unites all these, these the, the comics in the show and hopefully the project of recovery that you see uh, in the show is one where we're thinking about these different themes and pointing you to comics created by people of color who are providing a ways for us to sort of frame some of these things. So I'm gonna stop it, stop sharing my screen and hope that my internet doesn't fail. But, um, you know, go see the show is my last, <laughs> my last, my last thing. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Chambles. That was fantastic. Um, it looks like you're getting some claps in the uh, chat box. Um, now we'd like to open it up for questions. You can use the Q&A uh, function on Zoom. If you can't use that for some reason, feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. All questions answered. <laughs> Give people a little time to <laughs> type their questions out here. <laughs> All right, uh, a question um, coming from Paul, wondering about seeing the exhibition online. Uh, do you want to just say a word about what's happening with the process? Sure, we're using a virtual, <clears throat> um, a virtual, environment to, for the show. Uh, we're actually sort of rendering uh, uh, the inside of one of the gallery spaces. And when it goes live, you'll be able to sort of like click on it and like walk through. And what we're what we're doing is um, we have uh, select pages from each one of the, the comics that are uh, part of the show. And as I, I think I've spoken about before, the the actual format of the show is sort of divided up into themes. And we have a couple of different comic books under each theme. So like the theme of aesthetics, the, the theme of uh, metaphysics, the theme of gender, the theme of science, the theme of community. The reason I picked these, these things is that I think they correspond to a kind of consistency related to Afrofuturism. And so when you're going into the show, what you're seeing is, um, specific panels and pages from comics that align. Um, um, this is just, as I say, a snapshot of the wider world of Black comics. And these are independent comics for the most, almost all, yeah, they're all independent comics uh, and inspired at, at some level by the Afrofuturist framework that I'm uh, speaking about in these gallery talks. So I'm very purposely not showing every every comic, every talk. Uh, but what you'll be able to do is go in and so like linger over a page and look at the details and, and look at our little write-ups and, and things like that. Okay, we have another question. Uh, could you tell us about the provenance of the items in the exhibitions from which collections and if you had any issues of licensing? Right, so all the 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 comics in the collection are from um, sort of like contemporary, except for our, uh, contemporary creators. So we, we, we have license uh, documentation for all of them. So we, you know, we pay them a licensing fee thanks to the fact that we have funding for the uh, Michigan Humanities Council for this show. And so when you're looking with, um, you look at individual pages, we've contact, I've contacted the artist and um, asked their permission and they've given their permission and that's how they're in the show. Uh, the, one, the one example of something that's sort of like in the public domain is actually all Negro comics number one, which is a comic that you can go and download um, through various places that I probably should make it easier and put something on the website for that. Uh, but you can, you can download that, uh, but all the rest of it Either you can purchase it in its entirety, because again, we do not, because it is contemporary work, um, it's not, uh, we're not, we're not publishing the whole story, right? Like you're not getting the entire, 
you're not getting the entire story, right? You're getting you're getting select pages, like three pages or something. Uh, so if you want to read the entire story of the invention of E.J. Whitaker, you can, you can go to Comixology, which is a digital comics platform. You can buy it right now. Uh, all these comics are in our collection. Uh, I'm pretty sure. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure about that. Uh, but they're all they're contemporary comics for the most part. One 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 example. Uh, they do cover a a, a period a longer period of time. So, for instance, Brother Man, which is a comic from the 1990s, that is in the show, uh, and and that is uh, a little bit harder to get, but you can get it through Amazon, for instance. Uh, the latest graphic novel, and that's that's available as graphic novel. But um, almost all the other ones, um, you can buy right away. Like when you go there, you be like, "Oh, Jibba Anderson." You can go to his website and you can download. You can buy his comics like the same day. Um, the same thing, you know. Uh, we have original pages from Parable of the Sour, which is an adapt adaptation of uh, Parable. Parable of Sower, uh, an ad, a comic adaptation of Octavia Butler's novel. That just came out and we have pages from that, but you can buy it on Amazon right now, right? It's John Jennings and Damian Duffy. So there you go. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, you started talking about the cyborg post-humanist versions of Afrofuturisms. Do you think these kinds of Afrofuturism are always limited or can they be ever more radical? Um, any examples? Sure, I mean, I, I think that the, the cyborg um, epistemology and, and Afrofuturism is a historically specific one, right? At the time when Derry was talking, the vision of sci-fi that was uh, dominant was cyberpunk. I think William Gibson, and so on and so forth. And so there was a, a kind of emphasis on a kind of cybernetically enhanced uh, neo, you know, neoliberalism in the future uh, that was regressive in a lot of ways. And part of the part of the emphasis in Afrofuturism that's implied in in at that moment that that term is coined is trying to turn away from that. So the idea of a prosthetically enhanced future is very historically uh, specific. And that idea does not persist in our contemporary language around uh, futurism, right? Because now the technology available to us is different. And so when we think about what a radical future looks like, it it's more biological based because like we we made real gains in biological and nanotechnology. So if we were inventing the language of Afrofuturism today, it wouldn't necessarily be quote unquote prosthetically enhanced. It would um, be more body manipulation because prosthetically enhanced really, at least in my opinion, emphasizes an idea of um, your body being extended through technology, right? You you know you replace something that's um, broken or worn down with something mechanical. In and in the science that we have now, a bio a biotech science, a nanotech science, the nature of that replacement would be that the thing would look like it's real, but it would not be real. It would be like the infusion of technology internal to your body. Right, so the the nature of what humanity is becomes much more problematic because the nature of the integration of the technology with you is much more subtle. So the more radical visions around um, thinking about body manipulation go to more what does it mean to be human. Uh, it speaks to some of these questions around uh, blending or, or blurring uh, boundaries around identity, be the gender identities or black or whiteness. And keep in mind, when we start talking about biotechnology and nanotechnology, we start talking very, very, very seriously about hacking 
uh, expression of identity, right? Like in a very real way, you don't have to be black if you have nanotechnology and biotechnology. You can hack yourselves and you can be white or you can be silver or you can be red, right? Like what does it mean when you can change stuff at the biological level? Well, it means that patterns that you associate as being um, permanent and stable become unstable. And, and that also becomes a deliberate sort of narrative around of subverting hierarchies and power associated with those hierarchies that attach to skin color, which I'm, you know, surprised you don't see more of actually in, in science fiction. Although I, I think that it would probably be like a kind of horror for some people as opposed to liberation, right? Some of this is about what would be culturally and socially um, acceptable, right? So the politics of identity more are complicated, let me put it that way. But uh, yeah, I think that there, there's a clearly, as the technology, our, our narrative around technology and our narratives around technoculture uh, take into account um, the way that technology both creates our understanding of other, our understanding of race, the possibilities that people are going to imagine different ways to hack that, to subvert that, become very, very, very real. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's another question. Can you say more about John Jennings' work, especially as uh, a reimagining or continuation of all Negro comics? If I heard you right, the ANC did not continue beyond 1947. Seems like Jennings' work could be connected to the critique of the narratives of success and failure that you described with respect to ra racialized geographies. Yeah, what John is doing, at least in, in the series that he has shared with us for the show, you're right. There's there's an attempt on his part to 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 create a kind of speculative object represented through the covers of all Negro comics, and he in fact has a number of characters that are reimagined from all Negro comics. Uh, in speaking with him about about these covers, he said, yeah, I, I, you know, he's a busy man. So he's done other of these characters, but you just haven't seen them yet uh, because he has original stuff that he's, he's doing. So uh, where this sort of fictive narrative um, associated with all Negro comics sits is that it, it, it typifies uh, the possibility of recovering the lost potential associated with all Negro comics, right? And as a commercial entity, as, as an expression of a kind of black visual culture that might have been in the context of the broader, broader comic culture of, of the last 50, 60 years. So in these covers, he is trying to, you know, imagine um, the ways that black people might have navigated these, the pivotal social political transformations of the last 50 or 60 years. You know, how, how would Black voices contend with um, transformations and, and challenges related to um, Africa's placement in the global, global uh, economy, the, the end of the Cold War, um, the rise of, of what we understand to be a kind of free market uh, capitalism and, it's, and, and the troubles that that represents, you know, what what would black heroes do in in that context, right? Um, for many of the comic book characters that engage in Africa from the American context, uh, in particular around uh, more popular genres like superheroes, they are tied up in an American visioning of those places, right? Like while they might be black characters unless they're being written by Black people, they're often put in this sort of weird position of affirming the overall social, political, global order, right? And you can think about War Machine, the War Machine series from the 1990s, where the James Rowe character, War Machine, is actually leading a kind of transnational organization. And he has adventures in, in Africa, but those adventures don't necessarily lead to 
as he, you know, the stated intention of the character to make things better, they actually uh, often lead to a kind of like a forced stalemate because as a black character, he's not allowed to do things that I think a lot of black people reading the comic at the time would have been like, yeah, you should help these black people overthrow or push out or, but, you know, in the context of like Cold War politics, you know, the United States has its interests and the comics that are being produced by white people in the United States affirm those interests, right? So there's a real, there's a real potential in the stories that might be told in this fictive world that um, Jennings is creating. But let me be clear, these are just covers that he's creating. He's not actually making all Negro comic stories, at least not yet. Right, he's he's literally doing the covers as a kind of like critical making exercise. Like, what would it what would it look like? What would have happened if all Negro comics, black drawn, black black written, black published comic book company existed? How, how would they handle the sort of like evolution of comics in the United States if they were like a commercial comic book company like a Marvel? Right, like they're they're making superhero characters. What would they look like? Well. That's a really provocative question because we know the the placement of the black superhero uh, can be a really complicated one in the context of like um, a mainstream narrative. Okay, thank you. Um, one final question. Looks like we have one one more to go here. Do you have any thoughts or reflections on the cancellation and possible potential of Roxanne Gay and Ta-Nehisi Coates' World of Wakanda series? Yeah, I I think that the World of Wakanda was a really interesting series because it was really in the world of Dora Milaje, um, which is which was a really potentially a compelling story. It's important to recognize that the world of Wakanda was telling the backstory of characters that were in the main Black Panther series. Um, I think the world of Wakanda was never really positioned to be like an ongoing series. Like it was never really positioned to be that way, in part because uh, it was telling the story of characters that were just introduced in the pages of the the main series that Tomasi Coates is writing. So in the marketplace of comics, that was already that right there was a problem. So it didn't matter who the characters were, they were gonna have, have a problem. I think they can return to those characters and, and some of those characters live on in other comic books and, and live on other series. And they could still return to those to that to that if they wanted to. I don't know if they want to right now, uh, in part because the characters that have the most sort of like public attention are like Shuri, which has got his own, her own, her own um, ongoing series, which is based on the movie version of Shuri, not the comic version of Shuri, which is a real thing. There's a difference there. And so, um, you know, they could do it as an anthology series and they could bring it back periodically, bring it back quarterly or something. But they haven't made any moves to do that. And, I, and I'm not quite sure uh, why that is. The Black Panther character has, you know, gone on, gone back to at some of the Avengers, but some of these secondary characters, um, they, haven't, they haven't developed them enough. Uh, and we'll, we'll have to see they have just announced a television series that Ryan Coogler is going to develop. And while I think that they probably should make it a historical series, there is a lot of demand that that series be about um, the Dora the Milaje. And I totally understand that. I think the Dora Milaje could support a series, but I also think that the idea of a a historical series that sort of tells us the story of Wakanda in the past and that will allow for them to tell more nuanced stories of a greater African history and bring some of the real African characters into dialogue with Wakanda. Um, yeah, that would be really interesting. 
But ultimately, as Roxanne Gay said, I think they never advertised the series. That's not exactly true. They advertise the series as the, like they advertise every series, which in itself is really a problem if you're if if you know comics. Like comics have a legacy distribution system, and with something like the World of Wakanda, they really needed to uh, think outside the box, right? Like I think something like the World of Wakanda would be great as a digital only series for that eventually gets collected into a physical thing. Right, because you could. Now we're getting into like the economy of comics, but um, they've experimented in the past with digital only things, and then after a certain point, they published them. And for something like World of Wakanda, that could be really, 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 really successful, because it would allow for people who want that kind of content to find it, and once enough people find it and engage with it then they would know that they could publish it as a physical thing and they could sell it through the book channel as opposed to selling it through the comic book shop channel, which is a much more complicated exercise. The reason comic books get canceled is because the end customer in a comic book channel, nine times out of 10 is a comic book shop owner and a comic book shop owner is ordering based on what he sold before. So he doesn't know the new fan, he knows the old fan, right? If you want to see, if you know, if you want to see a certain kind of comic, you have to go through a process where you go to previews, which is the, the catalog they send out before they publish the comic. You go like, oh, they're publishing this comic about like the door Melage. Then you have to go to a comic book shop and you be, I want to pull, which is a reserve subscription. Like, I want you to put this comic book on my pool. And then the comic book shop owner knows, oh, I have 10 people who have said they want this new comic that's coming out. Therefore, I will order 10 copies because I know I will sell 10 copies. Comic book shop owners aren't so much racist as they're like afraid they're going to go out of business. I mean, this that's to be the truth, right? This is why the difference, ha this is why when something makes it to the trade paperback um, distribution, meaning that you can buy it on Amazon, like Ms. Marvel, like you can buy the collected edition on Amazon, the audience explodes because that audience doesn't go to a comic book shop, but they know they want this content. So the trick for the comic book company is to get the content from the sort of like individual issue, individual stories, to the collected edition so that the max amount of people can buy it. And that's really complicated. And there ends your, your narrative about the structure of comic book distribution and why it's problematic. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that was definitely very interesting. The whole talk was interesting. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chambliss for today. Uh, we really appreciate you doing this and we appreciate all of our audience members being here. Uh, if you have just a minute, please hang around and I'm launching the poll right now so that you can give us feedback about your experience. 